have Professor Wu from the University of Toronto, who has graciously agreed to join us. And I wanna thank everyone for your support over the course of the last academic year. The Center for Chinese Studies is winding down our programming. We will probably have two additional uh, events in our Taiwan and Dialogue series. So keep your eyes posted to our email list for information about those. But we are coming to a close. So thank you all for your support over the last academic year and for our series of virtual events. Hopefully in the coming academic year, we'll, we'll be able to tr start transitioning to more in-person events like the old days. Uh, and I want to encourage everyone, if you're not already a member of our mailing list, uh, you can sign up at the Center for Chinese Studies website. You can also follow us on Facebook for information about upcoming events. And our YouTube page has a large archive of past events, which you can stream at any time. I'm going to hand the podium over today to my colleague, Professor Andrea Goldman from the History Department at UCLA, who will be the Master of Ceremonies for today's event. Uh, it's a kind of hybrid event because she has her students in a classroom at UCLA, and they will be engaging with the speaker and have prepared questions, and she will also be introducing our speaker today. So I'm going to hand it over to Professor Goldman, and thank you all for your support. Great. Uh, thank you, Professor Barry. Um, and I want to thank the Center for Chinese Studies for um, sponsoring this talk, but also really sort of embracing the combination of uh, presenting scholarship, but also uh, really intertwining that with, with the educational mission that we do at the university. And so um, allowing my class to have this opportunity to engage directly with really eminent scholars in, in the field. Um, so without further ado, let me provide an introduction to our guest speaker today. Our speaker is uh, Professor Yiqing Wu, who is an Associate Professor of East Asian Studies at the University of Toronto. Trained in the discipline of anthropology at the University of Chicago, his research focuses on the history and politics of the People's Republic of China during the Mao era, and particularly the Cultural Revolution. His book, The C Cultural Revolution at the Margins, Chinese Socialism in Crisis, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2014, won the President's Book Award from the Social Science History Association. Now this study, um, really a remarkable study, analyzes the alternative narratives of political protest that emerged in the Cultural Revolution in multiple places at different junctures in time. These alternative narratives did exactly as the Cultural Revolution prescribed. That is, they critiqued the emergence of class privileges and class rule in New China, which critics argued had created a caste-based system. And the direction of the Cultural Revolution, in fact, threatened to perpetuate these class contradictions. Now, by highlighting the emergence of such class critiques and their subsequent brutal suppression, Professor Wu's intellectual history of the Cultural Revolution asserts that class did indeed matter to those who took the Cultural Revolution at face value. The state's crackdown and restoration of order was then a double betrayal. In dismissing the rest guards, Red Guards and asserting military control, it ended the Cultural Revolution as we imagined it, and also extinguished its own need of revolution. Um, now today's talk by Professor Wu, How to Study the Cultural Revolution by Forgetting About It, Rethinking the opening episode in Mao's Last Revolution is part of his work on a new book in progress. So we're delighted to have Professor Wu here with us today to share his new research. Um, as Professor Barry just said, this talk is part of our Center for Chinese Studies lecture series, but it's also being hosted in conjunction with my capstone seminar this quarter on politics, culture, and nostalgia in the People's Republic of China. And toward that end, just for the whole audience that's out there, after Professor Wu's presentation, I will let students in my seminar be the first to ask questions, after which the floor will be open to the full audience for questions that can be asked through the Q&A function on Zoom. So with that, let me turn things over to Professor Yiqing Wu. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Berry and Professor Goldman. Uh, and also I want to thank uh, the Center for China Studies at UCLA for hosting this talk. Uh, it's a uh, great privilege to speak at such occasion 
even though I wish I could be on site to interact with the scholars, the community at UCLA in person, but maybe sometime in the future. Uh, in trying to think of the title for this talk, I really kind of struggled uh, whether, you know, it may feel a little bit confusing. Why should we study the cultural evolution by forgetting about it? And uh, not being a native speaker, uh, I was a little bit uh, more than unsure whether I should use uh, forgetting about or forget the culture of watching or forget about the culture of watching. I really munched on it, but then I realized that when you say forget something, you really literally mean you forget something. For example, if I say, oh, whoops, I'm sorry, I forgot the talk today. I overslept. I took a nap. I overslept. That's like, you know, I, you know, I forget the talk. I forgot the talk. But to forget about something, you know, just if somebody said to me, you know, just forget about the talk in UCLA, nobody would listen to you. That means you actually, you actually know about it, you remember it, we just, for some reason, you just want to suspend your knowledge, you want to just put it aside, so, or you just want to bracket your knowledge about it. So it means something very different. So it's in the second sense that I use the uh, uh, phrase forgetting about, and I will explain uh, why we should, in studying the culture of wishing, we should really, you know, try to forget about it, to set aside our knowledge. It's like in maybe some kind of Husserian uh, sort of, I mean, phenomenological sense to bracket our knowledge about the culture of worship. And that would open up a space of uh, uh, empirical, interpretive and methodological space for uh, deepening our understanding. Uh, before I uh, start uh, my talk, my content, I will want to pay tribute to the uh, long-standing UCLA scholar, Professor Richard Baum, who taught at UCLA for 44 years and who was a ex prolific expert on the Mao Chinese politics in general and also Mao's China in particular, whose uh, pioneer work on the 1960s, the cultural Wuxing, uh, has well, benefited me greatly. And you know, I didn't have the opportunity to meet with Professor Baum, but we had corresponded before. Uh, 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 more than 10 years ago, and uh, he was a very kind person. Uh, and he, uh, uh, he published a uh, memoir, uh, The China Watcher, and my favorite part was when he talked about, he disclosed his memoir that when he was in Taiwan in 1966 studying Chinese, and he stole the top secret documents from the Taiwanese archive and uh, 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 illegally, illicitly, let's say, copied them. Uh, that made possible his, his dissertation on the uh, Siqing movement in the mid 1960s. It was a great book. It was the only book on the Siqing uh, episode in the mid 1960s, and it still remains the only one. I and mean, the first one, the only one. So I just want to pay tribute to Professor Baum, and I wish he would be here and I would benefit from his insights. So, okay. So uh, the Cultural Revolution uh, was launched by Mao in 1966. Actually, it was uh, by, all, by all official accounts, by all accounts, it was officially launched yesterday, uh, 56 years ago, on May 16th, 1966, which incidentally happened to be a Monday, 56 years ago. So uh, this is, the, this today is May 17th, it's a little bit, you know, slightly special. So the uh, Cultural Revolution was one of the most profound crises that Communist China had ever undergone. In initiating the Cultural Revolution, Mao claimed that enemies on what he called the bourgeoisie, quote unquote, had infiltrated the ruling Communist Party and conspired to subvert the revolutionary state and that they must be destroyed, exposed and destroyed by direct mass action from below, unrestrained by China's party state bureaucracy. Uh, so the, the country's gigantic party and state bureaucracies became paralyzed or even crumbled under widespread rebel attacks that were unleashed by the paradigmatic leader of the very same apparatus that both personally founded, that he personally founded and embodied. The spectacle of, of ferocious rebel attacks on the party state bureaucracy and the bureaucrats was unprecedented and a truly extraordinary. So why? And how Mao initiated a great upheaval during the last years of his rule has remained perhaps the single greatest puzzle in the crisis-laden history of the People's Republic of China. So why, the question of why did the Cultural Revolution happen or why did Mao launch the Cultural Revolution there basically, and these are all very well known, so I'm just going through very, very quickly, okay. Uh, just to set up uh, uh, my ideas on how we can go forward. 
Uh, basically, there are two uh, very broad views, you know, maybe we can say two kind of very broad kind of historiographical traditions, I mean, scholarly traditions, you know, may, there are also maybe some scholars that are kind of straddling in between. The first one is what I would call the political interpretation, which started from the Great Leap Forward debacle and the national economic crisis, you know, late 1950s and early 1960s, the Great Famine, and Mao's, you know, Mao's political prestige was severely damaged. And there were significant divergences, disputes, and even conflicts among the top Chinese leadership. And the Cultural Revolution was seen usually in this tradition is seen by you know, as Mao's attempt, you know, to you know, he 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 Mao plotted uh, to launch the Cultural Revolution in order to come back to the center of power, to return to the center of power. You know, this is a very familiar view. It's very you know, widely held by many people. And there's also another tradition, you know, the maybe we call the ideological interpretation, you know, then the which will talk about Mao's growing dissatisfaction in the 1960s, you know, starting from the early 1960s, you know, his satisfact dissatisfaction with the party state and its political and ideological directions. And scholars would talk about the Sino-Soviet disputes, you know, I mean the debates. The uh, 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 socialist China's departure from the established the Soviet model of so state socialism, and Mao's concern with the so-called revisionism, so on, so on, so forth, and they would talk about how late Maoism may be understood as a certain, I mean, variant or form of anti-bureaucratic, populist egalitarian critique of Soviet-style. Uh, state socialism. You know, this I, I wrote about this kind of view in my in my in my previous book, and I talk about I talk more about the kind of the populist critique emerging from the cultural revolution movement that utilizes you know uh, appropriated official Maoism, but then significantly move beyond that. Uh, the genies that that got out of the box uh, that was eventually put back into the box by the uh, uh, by the leaders of the cultural revolution, including Mao himself. So then. Uh, the question of, but okay, so the both, I mean, these two traditions, they are very, you know, different. And they're quite, they're very different, you know, analytically, interpretively, and also maybe the, I mean, political, they are, you know, different, very different kind of political, uh, I mean, and sympathies. Uh, but they share uh, common premises, uh, both these traditions. Uh, Mao, uh, uh, both for both these, you know, uh, uh, school of thoughts, uh, Mao is usually seen as the architect and the mastermind of the culture of Wuxing. You know, and the culture of Wuxing is, can be seen as to be derived from Mao's preconceived, you know, intent, Mao's ideas, you know, whether we call that Maoism, late Maoism, or the ideology of the continuous revolution, so on and so forth. So uh, whatever you talk about the culture, I mean, Mao and the culture, I mean, whether the, uh, 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 it was a, the culture of Wuxing was a, a, a derived from a, you know, the, the, a, a radical ideological vision, a utopia vision, or whether it was a power struggle, a, a you know, uh, or a conspiracy, uh, Mao was, you know, the, as seen as the center, you know, as the architect, the mastermind, uh, or the art, I mean, um, well, whatever you say. Uh, and then the, 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 all these sort of the, the conspiratorial activities, the plotting, the, the orchestrations that made the cultural revolution possible, that ushered in the cultural revolution. And then the major events leading up to the full breakout, to the full break, the full eruption of the cultural revolution, which is you know, either you date it to you know, in 19, May 1966, which was the day when the uh, uh, party document, the so-called the uh, the May 16th circular, we are your which was, you know, passed, uh, well, well, 56 years plus one day ago, or if you date the beginning of the Cultural Revolution to the, you know, to the summer of 1966, which was the full eruption of the Red Guard movement, then major events leading up to the full eruption of the Cultural, cultural Revolution then formed calculated phases of Mao's conspiratorial maneuver to initiate the general assault. So these are the shared premises. You know, this, these are all very, I mean, very much commonsensical to us. So then the question of how the cultural revolution really began, you know, there's also deeply entrenched conventional wisdoms that are widely held by, 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 by people, by scholars and by, by, uh, uh, 
by, by, by lots of people, including, let's say, my father, let's say, my father or my mother. So uh, the story usually started from, you know, late 1965, you know, the so-called catalyst or the opening salvos, the, which I'm going to talk more about you know, later today, you know, the assault on um, prominent cultural figures, intellectuals, and also party officials, then the dismissal of top CRA generals to seize control of the military, which took place in December 1965, and the attack on and the seized control of the propaganda and ideological establishment, which took place in the early spring of 1966, then the attack on the Beijing municipal party leadership in order to secure the national capital, which took place in April to May 1966. You know, that was a time when, this, when the, uh, uh, the so-called May 16 circular of Wuelotong was passed. That was, that was the official, the cultural revolution was officially assured into being. Then, uh, in the words of Roderick McFarquhar, you know, then it came to the, the what, what he called the translation of high-level intrigue into mass mobilization, uh, the, the Mao's instigation of campus unrest, student unrest, for example, the first Dazba or the big character wall posters at Beijing University, which appeared in late May 1966. Then it was followed by the unleashing of student rebellions in universities and middle schools across the country which lasted from May to July 1966. Then finally, the frontal attack on the party center, Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, you know, that was in early August 1966. Then finally, finally, the big bang, the full eruption, the all out mobilization of the Red Guard movement uh, and the full eruption of the cultural, cultural revolution, uh, which is also in August 1966. So this narrative, you know, this is the well-established, the deeply entrenched narrative that we are all very familiar with. And of course, the, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, authoritative work, the exhaustive work version of this story was put forth by uh, Professor Roger McFarquhar at Harvard, who passed away uh, in three years ago in 2019. Uh, and the uh, Professor McFarquhar being the doyen the uh, cultural voting scholarship. You know, he's a uh, tour de force. He's a uh, monumental work. The three volume, the trilogy, the origins of the cultural voting, uh, volume one, volume two, volume three. You know, which cover the Chinese you know, politics, uh, high level politics from 1956 to 1966. You know, all together, 1700 pages. The first volume was published in 1974. Second volume published in 1983. And third volume published in 1997, which won the the uh, uh, the Levinson Prize from the Association of Asian Studies. Indeed. And then the last volume, which finally in 20 in in uh, 2006, which is the 40th anniversary of the Cultural Revolution, uh, Professor McFarquhar and his collaborator Michael Schoenhaus uh, published the massive volume, 800 pages, Mao's Last Revolution, which finally got to the Cultural Revolution, you know, proper, you know, uh, 1966 to 1976. And the first one third of the book about, you know, uh, was about the, uh, how the Cultural Revolution began, which, you know, is the story that I want to uh, re-examine and retell. Uh, so, uh, okay. So now the, uh, uh, about the opening episode of the Cultural Revolution, or the, sometimes it's called the first salvo or the catalyst. The, by all accounts, the Cultural Revolution began with a bizarre and highly convoluted incident, an attack you know, in late 1965, November 1965, that was the time when it was initiated, an attack on a Ming, on a Ming historian, uh, Mr. Wuhan on the left here, uh, who incidentally was also a mid-level official. He was, a, he was the vice mayor of Beijing. Uh, and also on, not just on the historian, Mr. Wuhan, but also on the Peking opera play that he had authored about the Hairei Baguan, the dismissal of Hairei, of the Hairei dismissed from office. The uh, uh, Mr. Wuhan, you know, the historian and vice mayor of Beijing, you know, he, uh, he this play was about uh, an incorrigible Ming Dynasty Confucian literati official 
whose name was Hyre, uh, that the, 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 the historian and the play was attacked in 1965, late 1965 and early 1966 was attacked viciously, abruptly and viciously. It was denounced as a veiled criticism of Mao and an allegorical attack on the party, on the party's uh, great leap forward, I mean, on the great leap forward policy. So now we need to go back to the Great Leap Forward, the collapse of Great Leap Forward, but this, all the this story is very well known. It's all very well known. So I'm just going to, you know, going through very quickly just to set up the ground. So the collapse, you know, the Great Leap Forward, we all know the story, the Great Leap Forward radicalism, you know, all the, you know, the uh, uh, irrational exuberance, you know, then the country deceptions, you know, over reporting and of, of grain of the production targets, over extraction of resources, then, you know, very quickly, the Great Leap Forward collapsed in 1950. 59, 1960, which led to the massive famine. You know, scholars are still debating how much people died, whether it's 15 million, 30 million, or somebody might even, some people might even say, like Frank Dakota say, it's maybe as much, you know, as many as uh, 60 million. So these are all, you know, uh, uh, something else. But, uh, but the, uh, uh, during, at the height of the grading forward, uh, there was somebody who, Courageously, candidly, uh, I mean, criticized the Great Leap Forward policy, even criticized personal criticized Mao. So it's Marshall Pen you know, this is a familiar figure, China's war hero, you know, the commander in chief of the Chinese army in the Korean War, and then China's Minister of Defense. You know, at the pivotal uh, Mount Lushan Party Platinum Conference in the summer of 1959, where high party officials gathered to discuss the Great Leap Forward, you know, the, the direction of the Great Leap Forward, whether they should, you know, uh, make it more moderate because Mao was already aware of some of the problems. Uh, Marshall Pan wrote a letter to Mao that bluntly criticized the Great Leap Forward policies. And Mao took it badly as a personal attack. And he launched a counterattack on Marshall Pan and his sympathizers. You know, Marshall Pan had a number of sympathizers which both on the central and on the provincial, on the local level, provincial levels. And they were all denounced as anti-party elements, and then they all fell in disgrace. Uh, but interestingly, Marshall Pan, you know, in writing the letter to criticize the Great Leap Forward policy, Marshall Pan was actually responding to Mao's encouragement of direct, of candid talk, of criticism. Now, in the spring, before the Lushan Conference in the spring of 1959, Mao got interested in the, in, in the history of the Ming Dynasty. Mao checked out the books, you know, when he was having a conference in, in, in a Central Party conference in Shanghai, he checked out a whole set of Ming history from the Shanghai Municipal Library. And he read for Mao, you know, we all know Mao was a ferocious history reader. He, he was a history buff. And he, uh, uh, Mao encouraged the you know, honesty, integrity, and courage to criticize uh, in intra-party discourse. And he used the figure of Hai Rui, this Ming Dynasty Confucian veterinary who was known for his integrity, you know, for his courage uh, to speak truth to power, to directly challenge the authority of the emperor, the Ming emperor. Mao used the figure of Hai Rui to encourage party officials to speak directly, speak honestly, speak candidly. Mao even, you know, uh, 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 use this, uh, uh, he talked about this uh, seven not afraid of, he said, not afraid of being censured, not afraid of being demoted, not afraid of being dismissed, not afraid of being expelled from the party, not afraid of your wife divorcing you, and not afraid of being jailed, and not afraid of being executed. And he said, we as the communists, we should have the courage of speaking truth, speaking, you know, being, you know, having the virtue of being honest and candid, uh, speaking the truth. So, in fact, Marshall, Marshall Pound was actually responding to that. And the Mao, Mao, you know, uh, uh, in the spring of 96, uh, 1959, Mao even commissioned, asked his uh, propaganda officials to commission uh, articles uh, uh, on, you know, on this mean, uh, uh, mean literati high rate. And Mr. Wuhan, the historian, was actually commissioned uh, by Mao's secretary, you know, Mr. Hu Jiangwu, and also China's propaganda czar Zhou Yang, to write an article on Hai Rui. And the article was written by Mr. Wuhan, as it was later published in People's Daily. And then he later even, you know, Mr. Wuhan, also, I mean, the historian, 
being a Peking opera, an aficionado, uh, he wrote a play, you know, The Disappearance of Hairi. And in 1959, starting in 1959 to the early 1960s, you know, there was, you know, every, since Mao was kind of, you know, trying to promote this high rate spirit, so called high rate jingshen or high rate spirit, you know, lots of people jumped into action. There was a high rate craze in the, you know, late 50s and early 60s, early 60s. There were numerous uh, cultural literary products on high rate, you know, uh, different, uh, a number of many, you know, uh, theatrical. Uh, renditions. Uh, it was the Hairi story was rendered in uh, uh, Peking Opera, different version of Peking Opera in, Ch in, Shanghai, in Shanghai. The Hairi Dismiss Office was produced in, in, uh, in Beijing by uh, the Peking Opera Master, uh, by the Peking Opera Master Ma Liang. And there was also another version, very you know, if, you know, popular one, the Hairi Scolds the Emperor, or Hairi Ma Huangdi, was produced in Shanghai by the Peking Opera Master Zhou Xingfang. And there were also the Hairi story was adapted to other very different kind of regional uh, operatic uh, uh, formats. You know the uh, uh, Cantonese opera. You know, for example, uh, the I mean all kind of many kind of you know uh, uh, the or the the, the uh, 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 or Yue Ju the uh, uh, that was popular in the Jiangsu in the Southeast China region. You know, Hairi story was also adapted to uh, to film. Uh, to children's uh, picture book, uh, all kinds of things. So there were many, you know, pamphlets, you know, uh, so on and so forth. So, but then, you know, uh, uh, Wuhan, when he wrote about Hairi, you know, he wrote a pamphlet, you know, he, he, he wrote a picking up a play and he submitted these things to Mao and Mao initially actually liked it. You know, Mao uh, dined with Wuhan. They actually knew each other well, you know, personally. Uh, Mao even presented Mr. Wuhan with a set of uh, autographed, uh, he's uh, he's uh, the Mao selected works as a personal gift to Wuhan to 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 express his appreciation of Wuhan's work. But interestingly, and still we don't quite understand this because we don't really have enough sources. At some point in the mid 1960s, Mao apparently changed his mind. Mao became uncomfortable about all these high rate stories. Uh, there were different kind of you know uh, uh, informations, but with, uh, none of which can be confirmed that it was whether it was actually instigated by. Mao's wife Jiang Qing, uh, or whether it was uh, uh, Mao or the, uh, the the sinister Kangshen, who was also the heavily involved in ideology and propaganda work, and they said things to Mao, and the whole the Hadri story was actually a veiled, you know, it was a veiled satire. It's allegorical attack on you on the way forward, and then Mao then didn't feel comfortable, start not to feel comfortable. I mean, we don't know. But the fact was that start some, sometime starting in the 1960, maybe 1963, 1964, you know, Mao started not to be comfortable. Then uh, what we do know very clearly is that in uh, early 1965, you know, Mao's wife Jiang Qing uh, went to travel to Shanghai to do this project. And he recruited two, you know, Shanghai, you know, radicals, the 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 uh, radical propagandists, you know, uh, Yao Wenyuan and Zhang Junqiao, who later became part of the Gang of Four of the Sunbang. And Yao Wenyuan was the main author. You know, they spent all together. They spent months, you know, secretly working on an, a a very long article, you know, denouncing uh, the. Uh, Wuhan and his Harry work, you know, not just a play, but also his historical work. Uh, then the uh, uh, the uh, the 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 uh, uh, I mean, the article was uh, uh, published. Uh, it was worked on secretly for eight months, seven months, and it was uh, uh, published in uh, November nineteen. Uh, 65 initially in Shanghai as a municipal uh, newspaper, Wen Hui Bao, but then was uh, uh, republishing in the Mini Bao in People's Daily and other journals. And then led to, uh, no, this is the Wuhan's uh, uh, downgrades during the Cultural Revolution you know, a year later. And he was publicly denounced with his uh, colleagues in the Beijing Municipal Party Committee, I mean, in the, in the Beijing Municipal Leadership. And Wuhan died in 1969 due to uh, uh, various kind of abuses. So uh, the uh, so this is how uh, Roderick McFarquhar, you know, in his most you know, authoritative work, uh, described this episode. And I'm quoting from McFarquhar. And he said, by early 1965, the chairman increasingly had in mind a major political movement to target high-level capitalist leaders. And he soon launched a covert 
operation to begin his purification of the party. In February 1965, Mao sent Jiang Qing, his wife Jiang Qing, to Shanghai on an undercover mission shrouded in absolute secrecy to light the first spark of the Cultural Revolution. Why Shanghai? Because Mao enjoyed the total support of Ke Qing Shi, you know, the Shanghai, the, the, the local party boss of Shanghai. Therefore, Shanghai was the obvious place to send his wife to launch this, his most extravagant scheme yet. Uh, by the way, uh, McFarquhar also suggested that, you know, citing the memoir as Mao's physician, Dr. Li Zhishui, McFarquhar suggested that Mao may have dispatched Jiang Qing to Shanghai for this mission in part to divert her attention away from his sexual flirtations, you know, uh, with nurses, his, I mean, whatever secretaries around him. So, but that's, you know, it's, it's, it cannot be confirmed. All right. So then the, uh, uh, the attack on this first salvo, the attack on Mr. Wuhan and the Hairei play and all these Hairei, you know, uh, 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 the, the, this, uh, you know, main history stuff, you know, very quickly widened uh, to include uh, the, uh, uh, the cultural and the intellectual establishment, as well as uh, Mr. Wuhan's colleagues within the Beijing Municipal Party leadership and also, more importantly, his superior in the Beijing Municipal Party leadership, which is, you know, who is Mr. Peng Zhen, Peng Zhen who is the uh, party boss of Beijing, a very important person. Uh, he, Peng Zhen was not just the uh, uh, party boss of the national capital. He was also the, the second ranking secretary of the Central Party you know, I mean, the, of the, I mean, of the Central Party Secretariat, which Deng Xiaoping was in charge of. He was, only next to Deng Xiaoping uh, in charge of the party's daily operations. He was even in the 1960s, Peng Zhen was often seen as the, you know, as a successor to Liu Shaoqi. If Liu Shaoqi was successor to, you know, to Mao, then Peng Zhen, or no, you know, at least, you know, you know, my father who was, you know, in the army in the 1960s, so that's what he or his comrades, I mean, whatever, colleagues all thought Peng Zhen was the, you know, second to, Liu Shaoqi, or even Deng Xiaoping as the, you know, as a successor. Uh, so, and then finally, you know, the attack widened to, you know, yeah, from, from, from Wuhan to his uh, 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 colleagues in the Beijing Municipal Party leadership to Peng Zhen, and then finally, it widened to include uh, the higher, I mean, the, I mean, the bosses of his boss, so it's Deng Xiaoping and Liu Shaoqi, that was the, you know, during the early years, uh, during the early phase of the Cultural Revolution. So, okay, so now this story of the opening salvo, this story, you know, forms the linchpin of the established scholarly historical narrative on how the Cultural Revolution began. The Wuhan and Hairei affair has been variously termed the prelude, the catalyst, or the opening salvo of the Cultural Revolution, and it was portrayed as a pivotal tactical move in Mao's game plan to initiate a radical attack on the, on the entire party and its leadership. This widely shared and deeply entrenched, you know, this is, has become the common sense you know, of the historiographical common sense, you know, is that the attack on Wuhan and his colleague was an indirect way, a detour to go against his superior, you know, Peng Zhen, and then the, you know, finally to Liu Zhaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, you know, and then this was part of Mao's, you know, larger scheme to seize control of the national capital in order to attack the top leaders, you know, as a whole. So uh, now it's something like this. If we you know, have to visualize, let's say, how the Cold Revolution began. Now, this is the Big Bang in the summer of 1966, you know, the eruption of the Ragan movement. You know, if we imagine Mao, no, if we, this is sort of the, no, maybe imagine Mao's big head. You know, Mao had a pretty big head at the very beginning. You know, he either had a utopian vision or he had a conspiracy, a power hungry conspiracy. Then step by step, Right, you know, we uh, talked about all these, uh, uh, the past, you know, all these, you know, antecedents. You know. Uh, then he manipulated, he maneuvered, he orchestrated. Uh, then finally, uh, it led to the it culminated in the uh, in the big in, in, in that's whether it's the May 16th circular in May, or the uh, the final eruption of the Ragan movement in in uh, in the summer. This is the uh, established, a 
deeply entrenched establishment view. And I think we need to reconsider that. So this view may have some problems, methodological problems, and empirical, also empirical problems. And I'm just going through very, very quickly, okay? Uh, first of all, this, you know, a view like this you know, is largely based on what in Chinese call tri more speculation and conjecture. And it cannot be you know, conclusively, compellingly you know, uh, 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 proven. You know. And second, this is a really a form of you know a kind of linear history. You know, this, there's a you know a, a single line of linearity, you know, pointing toward a future, you know, outcome. You know, so this is also you know relatedly, this is a form of teleological history. You know, in history we all know that teleological history is bad, uh, but I'm not going to get into it. And this is also a form of, you know, is uh, uh, it played with, you know, is you know, a, 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 the assumption of essentialism. You know, this is based on derive everything derived from Mao's preconceived intent, uh, his motive. You know, that was formed before the Cultural Revolution. We assume somehow that's you know, unchanged. You know, Mao just finally he manipulated, he navigated, he manipulated, he maneuvered to realize his preconceived objectives or intentions. Uh, in, liter in the field of literature, there's a concept called the intentional fallacy. You know, some literary scholars you know, a long time ago just argued that you cannot really in, uh, understand or interpret a literary uh, work by the intention of the author. You know, it doesn't have to be a literary work. It could be some kind of text, you know, cultural text, you know, a, a, a drawing, you know, a, 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 a painting of Van Gogh. You know. We all uh, go to the museum to ask, you know, when you look at the you know painting of Van Gogh, and you know if you ask the question, you know what does Van Gogh mean? What does he want to say? You know, what is the intention? You know, this is you know, some some literary scholar work. This is this is actually an interpretive fallacy. You, know, you cannot do that. Okay, but I'm not going to get into that. I actually teach a course on historical interpretive methodology that talks that focuses on the problem of problems of what I call T. You know, T teleology. I mean teleology. T A T, not T. No, no. Uh, teleology, essentialism, whoops, sorry. And then oh, finally, okay, finally, uh, 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 this also, there's a problem of presentism and anachronism. And I'm gonna explain that. So I have a course on T, you know, teleology, essentialism, and anachronism to, to uh, alert to students that, you know, these are some of, these are some of the problems that historians are quite, even very seasoned historians are quite often guilty of. You know. So, uh, so I'm going to focus on the problem of presentism and anachronism because that's core to what I want to argue today, why we should really try to forget about the cultural revolution. Uh, anachronism, you know, it's a strange word. Uh, it means you know, uh, the misplacement in time or the chronological juxtaposition of persons, events, objects, or customs from different time periods. And then presentism is actually a form of, you know, it's related, closely related to anachronism. It's the, you know, anachronist, an anachronistic introduction or maybe smuggling of present day or latter day, later day ideas and perspectives into the depictions or interpretations of the past. Uh, the, uh, and I'm gonna concretize this. Okay, this is sounds very, you know, uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, abstract, but I'm going to concretize it later. Uh, so the uh, established historical narratives of the, how the culture of began, you know, this kind of linear, teleological, you know, uh, progressive, you know, movement from Mao's preconceived intention to the final eruption, to the final realization of his intention, suffers from, you know, uh, presentist and anachronistic uh, uh, problems, you know, pitfalls. Uh, they have some serious problems. The problem derived from, and I want to argue, you know, from a certain unique facet of historical understanding, which is that, you know, we, we may put it this way, in comparison with historical contemporaries, you know, people, let's say, historians in, in this, try to study the culture of Washington, why it how and why it erupted in 1966 the way it did. So in, in, in comparison with people then, the historical contemporaries, the historians today enjoys a unique epistemological advantage in studying the past, 
which is that the historians knows what it all came out. What happened at the very end? He, the, the his, or she, knows the outcome of the sequence of historical development, while the people then didn't know or were unable to predict the future. So once, you know, as the historians know the outcome of the historical sequence, then the historian, he or she then goes back in time, you know, something like this, no, right? We, we know the outcome. Then the historian will go back in time to search for the antecedents or sometimes maybe the origins and to create the kind of narrative, you know, a kind of narrative to, that relates the antecedents to the final you know, outcome. You know, this is a very common type of, you know, historical, I mean, I mean, historical narrative operation. You know, uh, while this, you know, uh, 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 you know, epistemological position enjoyed by the historian, you know, his, his or her knowledge of the outcome may appear to be beneficial. Uh, it in fact poses, I would say, you know, the, I mean, it, it poses great a, a, a great obstacle, if not the greatest obstacle to a truly historical understanding. You know, the narrative operation starting from the outcome, the end point of the historical sequence, and going back in time, you know, maybe methodologically flawed. And I mean, this operation, you know, to select and to interpret past events based on their presumed relevance to the outcome. And the retroactive construction of a line of linear progression toward the outcome. You know, this presentist interpretation of the past of our past events by reference to the outcome, in fact, you know, it, it actually twists or even distorts the meaning of the past. You know, it removes uncertainties, ambiguities, and contingencies from the historic actors' life worlds and to make the unfolding of historical events appear seamlessly, seamlessly you know, inevitable. Uh, and I should add that this is what you know, often, what many, you know, the so-called, what I would call the origin narrative, you know, the origin of the French Revolution, you know, the origin of the Pacific, of the, of the First World War, the origin of the culture of Washington. You know, we may even, however much we may try to pluralize origin by adding S, talking about origins, you know, this often does that, you know, making this story you know this i mean i mean it's all based on this type of you know narrative i mean narrative interpretive logic then you know it results in a narrative of inevitability of a linear teleological narrative uh this okay so this all sounds quite 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 uh, uh abstract so i'm going to use a concrete example in the culture of washing you know, in my in, in the period that i study to to uh, uh to be an example so this iconic uh, incident uh, uh, of Chairman Mao's mouse history was called the historic swim that took place in July 16th, 1966. Mao was on his way from his hometown. Mao was having a grand tour of the country of the southern of, of the southern of, you know, of South China on his special train. And he was on the way back to Beijing, you know, he spent some days in his hometown Hunan, and he was on the way to back to back to Beijing, and he made a stop in Wuhan on July in, in mid July 1966. And then he jumped into the Yangtze River. He took a swim, and it was a celebrated moment. It was, you know, filmed. Uh, it was uh, uh, there was a huge celebratory festival. And this, you know, uh, 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 mouse swim was then, it appeared in numerous, you know, not just in Chinese propaganda work, uh, but also in Western, you know, media report, scholarly analysis, you know, presentations, so on and so forth, as a very, you know, as an iconic moment that the 73-year-old aging leader, now he tried to, uh, 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 this, you know, he tried to prove, you know, he tried to, by doing this, he tried to show, his uh, uh, physical vitality, you know, his vigor. Uh, and then this is a gesture, it's a signal. The, this aging leader is gonna lead the nation for a, a, a new, a, a, a grand revolutionary movement. 
So let's, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from Harry Harden in his uh, article in the Authoritative Collection, The Cambridge History of China, Volume 15. Uh, Harry Harden, the political scientist and veteran scholar on Mao's China. And he wrote, he said, on the way back to the capital, Mao stopped for a swim in the Yangtze River, an act intended to demonstrate that he had the physical vigor needed for the great political battles ahead. And let me quote another, uh, also political scientist, because, okay, uh, some time ago, it was only the political scientists who, 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 you know, who wrote about Mao's China. Uh, Richard Solomon, a, a, a veteran political scientist, professor of political science at Michigan, University of Michigan, who later became the uh, Assistant Secretary of State under the Bush administration. Uh, he wrote, he, he said, uh, after months of cloistered plotting, Mao suddenly resurfaced in Wuhan in the summer of 1966, the stage one of his greatest acts of political theater. On July 16th, Mao took a vigorous and well-reported swim in the Yangtze River by the Wuhan Bridge. You see the Wuhan Bridge in the background. It was a signal that Mao was in robust health and that he was launching a counterattack against his enemies, his critics in the party leadership. For the old man of the revolution, the swim was a call to China's younger generation to dive into the political struggle, the, the, what, the, the uh, uh, to dive into a political struggle against counter-revolutionary party bureaucrats. This all makes sense, right? By, you know, uh, uh, this was on the eve of the eruption of the Rega movement in August, 1966. So this, you know, this act of Mao, this is seen to be seen as a gesture. Uh, a mobilizing gesture. This all make very, uh, very much makes sense. Except that if you look at, if you take a look at uh, at Mao's whole life, you know, if you look at Mao, for example, the chronicle of Mao's daily activity. You know, this is a genre of Chinese uh, uh, the uh, 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 an autobiography. I mean, not sorry. I mean the the biography of important political figures in Yanpu that recalls daily activities of very important. You know, figures. Uh, there's something called the Mao Mao Zedong Yan for both the pre-1949 and post-1949 period. There were three volumes of Mao Chronicle for pre-1949 and six volumes of Mao Chronicle Mao Yan after 1949. And so, if you look at Mao's daily activity, you may find something that's very interesting. Mao was an avid swimmer. He loved swimming. You know, he the the Mao's, the chronicle of Mao's daily life you know recorded numerous incidents you know, of Mao took a swim somewhere anywhere and on July 18th 1966 after this Wuhan swim when after Mao got back to Beijing he lived in his swimming pool for the last 10 years of his life when we say Mao lived in his swimming pool we don't mean Mao just slept on a cot next to his swimming pool. Mao's swimming pool was a complex of buildings in Zhongnanhai, in the forbidden, I mean, in, in the central party headquarters in, in Zhongnanhai. And it was a whole building with, you know, has all kind of, had many rooms, you know, resting rooms, the bedrooms, you know, dining rooms, kitchens, nurse rooms, I mean, whatever. So, but Mao lived in his swimming pool building for the last 10 years of life. And he had meeting, numerous meetings with central party leaders, received foreign guests in his swimming pools. And Mao Nianpu recorded numerous incidents, you know, Mao swimming in Yangtze River, in, in reservoirs, in lakes. You know, Mao even talked about, you know, he when he received foreign guests, I think Marshall uh, Montgomery, I think, he talked about he wanted to go to the United States to swim in Mississippi, in the Mississippi River. And he also, uh, at one point, he wanted to swim, he proposed that, he insisted that he wanted to swim in the three gorges, which his bodyguard was, ter was terrified because three gorges the water was very turbulent. So it was immediately reported to the party bureau and the party bureau rejected, obstructed that the chairman is not allowed to swim in the three gorges. And the chairman insisted, you know, his bodyguards you know, investigated all kinds of safety measures, including, you know, deploying helicopters, whatever, you know, all kinds of safety measures. But finally, it was still vetoed by the party bureau. Mao was not allowed to swim in the, in the, in the, in the, in the three gorges. So on the day of July 16, 1966, when Mao passed by Wuhan, uh, there was actually a swimming, a municipal swimming festival. There were 10,000 youth were swimming in the Yangtze River. So it was quite likely 
the mom just got excited. Uh, and he took a swim. And, and by the way, it was not the first time the mouse swim, swam in the Yangtze River. According to the police, the, the, the memory, the memoir, the recollection of the police chief uh, of Wuhan, of the city of Wuhan, who was responsible for mouse security details. You know, whenever Mao, Wuhan was one of the mouse favorite cities, you know, he had a villa in, the, in, the, in Wuhan that he always, you know, he, he, he traveled to, I mean, he stayed in Wuhan numerous of times. Uh, the first time mouse swam in Wuhan was 1956. And between 1956 to 1966, Mao plunged in the Yangtze River for 42 times. Mao swam in the Yangtze River for 42 times in the Yangtze River. And 19, the July 16, 1960s, it was the last time Mao swam in the Yangtze River. So it was not really something that was so you know, exceptional or peculiar. You know, that, and there's no evidence, you know, at least there's no evidence that it was a calculated measure. You no, know, uh, to demonstrate them to the nation about you know it may have the effect it may be const, you know construed in the propaganda in you know, materials that you know are, are for its mobilizing you know effect but it was really you know this incident had its own original context it can be understood in its own original context it, it can be detached from this teleological you know anachronistic and and the presentist kind of narrative can be and to be understood in its own uh, uh, you know, original context. If we pretend that we do not know what happened in a month later, in August 1966, which is the eruption, the full breakout of the Cultural Revolution. So uh, this kind of, you know, uh, narrative, you know, this type of narrative operation, you know, had different various kind of, have been given different various names by scholar. You know, it was not, yeah, I, I talk about, you know, presentism, anachronism. It was called the Wake History, by the British historian Herbert Butterfield in his classic little book, published in 1931, 90 years ago. But I think the book is still highly relevant today because it's the kind of mistake that we make all the time. The Wake Interpretation of History. There was a, it was a little book, you know, finishing three hours. And it was called The Mythology of Prolapsus by the British intellectual historian at Cambridge University, Quentin Skinner, the Cambridge School of Intellectual History. And of course, he, was, he coined this term called the mythology of prolapsus. And in, psychologists, you know, in psychology, you, know, you may call that, the, this is the hindsight bias. No. Uh, so, uh, you know, this type of, you know, the, the so-called mythology of prolapsus, you know, uh, in, uh, in Skinner's, Quentin Skinner's definition, it's the type of mythology that we are prone to generate when we are more interested in the retrospective significance of a given episode than in its meaning at the time, you know, in its, and also maybe I should add in its original context. So here, let me quote, you know, to kind of conclude this kind of methodological preface uh, from uh, uh, a quote from Bernard Bailing, the, uh, a Harvard professor you know, who passed away two years ago at the age of 90, 96, 98, uh, 96, 94, maybe, you know, Bernard Bailey was the, uh, one of the most important historian of the American Revolution, the doyen of the history of the American Revolution. Uh, and this is what he wrote, uh, what he said. He said, the greatest challenge to historical thinking is to overcome the knowledge of the outcome. This is one of the greatest impediments to a truly contextualized history. Historians must remain faithful to the context of the time, and their most important task involves recovering the original context in which events take place by resisting the almost irresistible temptation of selecting from the historical data anticipations or maybe antecedents of what we know eventuated in later time. So uh, this is so. Uh, now you probably get what I'm trying to say. You know, in my in the title of the talk, you know, we should probably forget about the Cultural Revolution in order to understand, you know, how it, you know, uh, uh, how it came about. Uh, we should, you know, uh, try to uh, uh, suspend our knowledge, you know, uh, artificially. I mean, hypothetically, to erect a veil of ignorance. You know, I'm borrowing a term from John John Ross's book. You know, in a very different context. The uh, theory, I mean, theory of justice. You know, when you talk about the veil of ignorance, as a, you know, uh, and this hypothetical ignorance of the outcome. If we pretend we, you know, we do not know that the Cold War would broke out in the summer of 1966, then this might modify the meanings, the role of importance of the events 
you know, the preceding events, the so-called antecedents. And it may open up new, you know, interpretive, you know, empirical, uh, interpretive and methodological space, you know, to look at those events to, to generate a very different kind of, you know, I mean, narrative. So, okay. So now, uh, now let's get back to the first salvo. I mean, the, the original, I mean, the uh, opening salvo. I mean, the opening episode, uh, the first salvos, this Wuhan Hairi incident. So what was its original context? If we, you know, temporarily, I mean, hypothetically detach, you know, you know uh, because there's really no evidence that it was a calculated move by Mao, you know, uh, to start, you know, the culture of worship. So, and how do we understand the historical significance, you know, of this episode? So there are three possible lines of questioning. You know, if we want to rethink the opening salvo or the first salvo, the opening episode. First of all, we can we we can re you know, uh, about Mao's role, Mao's exact role in the first salvo. And second, was the first salvo really premeditated? It sounds like a nonsense question. Of course it was, right? And third, how do we contextualize or recontextualize the first salvo? How do we place this? this uh, preceding event in its original context. What was its original context? Okay, so Mao's role in the, in, in the, in the, in the Wuhan Hairi affair. Uh, this is something really interesting. You know, Mao's exact role, because all the stories said this was, you know, it was, it was, it was uh, uh, you know, uh, initiated. You know, I mean, I mean, all the scholarship. You know, this was one of the signature event of Mao's. You know, a manipulation. He's, he's, you know, initiating the culture of worship. Uh, but uh, upon closer examination, the picture was actually far less clear. There can be three possible scenarios, logically. You know, uh, first of all, you know, Mao conceived and initiated the attack. And Jiang Qi's wife, Jiang Qi, executed. This is a standard story that's you know, widely accepted. And second, it was actually, it could be Jiang Qi's initiative. And Mao was aware from the beginning, but he approved it. He went along with it. I mean, he, I mean, he approved it. And third, it was Jiang, Jiang Qi initiated, his wife initiated on her own, and Mao didn't know about it until later, but he went along with it no matter what. You know the 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 uh, uh, the difference may seem minor, on, but you know these nuanced differences actually would tell a significant different story. You know, that's you know different from the standard uh, narrative. Uh, the standard story actually came from Jiang Jing herself on two different separate occasions in April 1967 and then also in 1972, based on available documents that he was she was instructed by Mao to carry out the attack, to organize and carry out attack. The secret trip to Shanghai, so on and so forth. And uh, Mao spoke about this, you know, his own. I mean, um, at least you know, if we, you know, really systematically crawl through the documents, the the sources, Mao spoke about uh, uh, at least five different occasions. And interestingly, he gave two radically different stories. In February 1967. When Mao was meeting with the an Albanian, the the uh, uh, visitors from Albania, the Albanian uh, Defense Minister Bakir Baluku, you know, the transcript of the uh, of the conversation is available to us. And uh, Mao uh, said uh, to Albanian visitors said uh, uh, he he was talking about his oh well this article about Wuhan, you know, we cannot do it, we couldn't do it in Beijing because it was obstructed by the Beijing bureaucrats, so we had to do it in Shanghai. And then Baluku, the Albanian, asked Mao, he said, did the chairman instruct? I mean, was it instructed by the chairman? And Mao said, he said, he said, I didn't know. I mean, I, he, said, I, he said, at the beginning, I didn't know. He said, 开头我也不知道的. It was done by Jiang Qing. 是江青他们搞的. You know, they did it, and they, they, they sent the, uh, uh, I mean, the draft articles to me, and they told me that Wuhan needs to be you know, criticized, and they couldn't do it in Beijing, and they had to do it in Shanghai. He said, I didn't know it at all. So that was what Mao said on February, I mean, February 3rd, 1967. Then less than three months later, on May 1st, 1967, Mao was receiving another Albanian delegation, 
and Mao's story changed significantly. And he said, he said, well, he said, I was, this, this the great culture of Wuxing, you know, started in, uh, in 1965 with Yang Wenyuan's uh, criticism of Hai Rui. You know, uh, 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 he said at that time, you know, uh, 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 some of our, you know, the our state, you know, parts of our state, our government was controlled by revisionists. Uh, so I suggested to Jiang Qing to organize an article to criticize the Hai Rui play and Wuhan's work, but it, the job could not be done in this red city. He was referring to Beijing as the red city. So it had to be done in Shanghai. So Mao told the standard story three months later, less than three months later, uh, a totally different story. So we actually don't know conclusively. And we still don't know conclusively. I don't have a conclusive answer, but I just, I, I can, you know, what, what I want to do is to cast questions. And second, was the first salvo premeditated? No, of course it was premeditated, right? But the uh, uh, contrary to the established wisdom that the pre this you know it was the, this about premeditation, the uh, Wuhan and his Harry play was in fact not the predetermined target of attack. The most revealing account was given by Zhang Junqiao, one of the gang four members later, and he was closely involved in the uh, uh, in the in the in the drafting of the uh, uh, articles to attack Wuhan. And Zhang Chunqiao, uh, uh, in a Politburo meeting in uh, May uh, 1966, May, uh, May 6, 1966, you know, this document has become recently become available. And Zhang Chunqiao said, he said, and he was speaking to the, uh, to the, to the, to the, to a high level I mean, audience. He said, we were all, I mean, he was talking about, you know, how, I mean, the work that was being, I mean, that was done to, 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 uh, to draft the articles and so on and so forth. He said, we were aware that the chairman you know, was dissatisfied with Wuhan and his Hai Rui play. And we were also aware that in Beijing and in also across the country, you know, uh, people were divided about this play, about Wuhan's play and the, the you know, about Hai Rui and, and so on and so forth. So we wanted to study. So we wanted to study it. And upon careful study, we were surprised that there were numerous products you know, on Hai Rui. Uh, there were numerous, you know, uh, theatrical uh, operatic, you know, adaptations. You know, Peking Opera, Shanghainese Opera, Cantonese Opera, and all. I mean, there were so many, you know, you know operatic, you know, um, adaptations. And the Harry story was also adapted into film. Uh, there was also appeared in uh, uh, in school textbooks, middle school and, uh, and and primary school textbooks, and not to mention college level textbooks. Uh, there were also uh, children's picture books. Uh, and then he, he said, Tan Tunjia said, we carefully considered which one should we target? Should we target, if we you know, want to target a theatrical play, let's say a Peking Opera play, should we target Hai Rui Ba Guan or Hai Rui Sang Shu, which is you know, Hai Rui dismissed from office, or Hai Rui scolds the emperor? These are two. You know, then he's, okay, I'm going to explain later. He said, then we concluded, he said, the Hai Rui dismissed from office was too blatant. It was a blatant, blatantly, you know, counter-revolutionary, anti, you know, anti-party, you know, and it was more influential, uh, has the greatest evil influence. So we decided to concentrate uh, to target the Wuhan's play, uh, Hai Rui dismissed from office. So this is very, very interesting because, you know, the two Peking opera versions, Hai Rui Baguan, Hai Rui, Dismissed from office and Hai Rui Shang Shu, Hai Rui uh, Scots Emperor, they were produced respectively by Peking Opera Troupe in Beijing and Shanghai. The Hai Rui Dismissed from office was produced in Beijing by the under the you know the Peking Opera Master Ma Lingliang, while Hai Rui Scots Emperor was produced in Shanghai uh, under the Peking Opera Master Zhong Xingfang. So had they decided to target the Shanghai version? Then the, uh, the trajectory of the early culture of washing movement would have been very different because, you know, it would, you know, what would be for in disgrace would not probably would not have been the Beijing municipal leaders. You know, Shanghai was under the control of the radicals of the so-called, you know, radicals. So uh, this, you know, I think, you know, this, you know, uh, uh, speech, you know, uh, that has become recently available, you know, uh, proves 
conclusively that the so-called first salvo was not premeditated. It was not, you know, it was not predetermined. And uh, the third very important question that I want to talk about is to how do we contextualize or recontextualize the first salvo to by placing it into its original context. You know, uh, and I want to, and here I want to talk about cultural revolution before the cultural revolution. Uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, and, and to think about what a recontextualization may mean for producing a new different narrative of how the cultural revolution really began. So existing scholarship on the beginning, on the opening of the cultural revolution is premised on the idea that starting from mid 1960s, Mao had already begun to contemplate unleashing a mass attack, you know, on the party state. Uh, and the, and Wuhan, the Wuhan affair was the first salvo. Okay, this is all, no. Uh, uh, no, no, this is all very familiar. So now I argue that in my book that it will be difficult, if not impossible, to substantiate this view based on available evidence as it is mostly based, based on speculation and conjecture. In fact, an abundance of both existing and recently available sources suggest that Mao's disfact, dissatisfaction with the Chinese party state notwithstanding in the early and mid 1960s, the chairman was also dissatisfied with something else. He grew profoundly unhappy and increasingly impatient with the pace of radical changes in the broad arena of culture, broadly defined, education, academy, knowledge production and transmission, and the literature and arts. This body of material has been mostly ignored by scholars who have worked on how the culture of it began as it doesn't fit uh, the conventional Machiavellian narratives. Uh, I can show numerous of quotes from Mao, but I'm not gonna do that because it's gonna take half an hour by itself. But I just wanna say that even a cursory uh, perusal of these sources about Mao's pre-cultural evolution views on the cultural sphere would establish the fact, would conclusively establish the fact that in the, the mid-1960s, Mao in fact had in mind the initiation of a radical cultural movement, very broadly defined, a cultural revolution, maybe perhaps with a small c and a small r, uh, one that aimed not only to ideologically cleanse and purify the educational, academic, literary, and artistic fields, but also construct new forms of cultural and artistic expressions in accordance with politically militant principles. So, here, I would like to advance two bold suggestions, which will form the central arguments of the book that I'm writing now, slowly. And first of all, the so-called uh, Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, as it is known to us, uh, i.e. the mass popular assault on the Chinese party state and its leader as a whole, was in fact the contingent, path-dependent, and perhaps even the un un unintended outcome of something else, i.e. a radical cultural movement that skidded off course or even spun out of control. Second, this fragmented, chaotic, and unanticipated course of development was later massaged by Maoist propagandists into a seamlessly coherent story centering on the Supreme Leader's strategic intent. And I may add, for the past five decades, China and uh, uh, China, China and uh, cultural revolution scholars have remained large, mostly remained hostage to this manufactured story, and they still are under its sway today. So, if we argue that the cultural revolution may have really begun as something very different, as a radical cultural movement or a militant cultural reform, then the first salvo or the Wuhan affair would take on a very different significance. The Wuhan or Hairi affair was a vicious attack on what was viewed as an orthodox ideological tendencies in the cultural field. Sure, there may be personal politics, personal rivalry, or whatever is there, but it was attack on unorthodox ideological tendencies in, in, the cultural field, in the cultural and academic field. In fact, throughout Mao's China, there had been a long run of party sanctioned assaults on ideologically suspicious cultural and literary figures, currents, and activities. Uh, so instead of being the extraordinary 
first salvos of Mao's premeditated attack on the party and its leaders, the Maoists' vitriolic yet largely ad hoc attack on the cultural establishment on the eve of the cultural revolution, you know, in the as, as a, you know, in the in the in the in the Hairi affair, recalled numerous similar episodes that may be traceable back to the early PRC. So there's a long tradition of radical, cultural, radical, cultural, artistic, you know, literary, whatever you call that, educational radicalism that we may call cultural revolution. There's a long cultural revolution, you know, starting from the early PRC, right? you know, and I'm not going to talk about each of them because I think an entire book can be written, something called Cultural Revolution in China and the Mao. Uh, and then I just want to, uh, the, um, I want to mention that the Great Leap Forward was a very important moment of cultural radicalism, of cultural and educational radicalism that we may, at some point, I want to do a talk, a separate talk called The Great Leap Forward as Cultural Revolution. I want to uh, move away from the Great Leap Forward, uh, to move away from the famine-centric model to talk about the Great Leap Forward as a moment of radical social and cultural transformation. So uh, the Great Leap Forward, and there are all these uh, different agen various agendas, you know, uh, popular literacy, you know, new folk songs, you know, radicalization of education, you know, radicalization of historical research, uh, the Xi uh, the, Jinping, uh, uh, the radical drama and opera movement, modern drama, the mass science movement, the red and expert attack on old intelligentsia and the promotion of working class intellectuals. And then not to, we, we should not forget that cultural revolution of Wenhua Gemin was actually originally uh, ushered in as a greatly forward slogan concept. Uh, it was really promoted during the greatly forward cultural revolution. Uh, there are numerous books, many pamphlets. You know, I'm just giving some titles of Creative Forward Era pamphlets on uh, Wenhua uh, that you know people don't. You know, we have really totally ignored that prehistory, that genealogy of you know cultural radicalism. Uh, so okay, so now in the post Creative Forward years, you know, the cultural revolution, cultural revolution. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's not the cultural revolution. Okay, I'm making a distinction between culture between the cultural revolution, which is Wenge, and cultural revolution. You know, these are two different things. That's, uh, I want to make a, uh, a a demarcation here, which is, this is a very important distinction, I think. So, in the post creative foreign years, uh, cultural revolution or radical cultural movement continued. You know, you know, in 1962, 1963, you know, banning attacking the traditional ghost plays. You know, uh, there's a very good book by Maggie Green on the ghost plays, you know, attack on the so-called poisonous films and fictions, you know, that started in 1962, but lasted longer. And let's not forget the central cultural revolution group, Zhongya Wenge Xiaozhu, was actually originally formed in 1964, headed by Peng Zhen, uh, the party boss of Beijing, who fell in 1966 as a result of the Wuhan Hairi affair. And then 1964 was a very important year uh, because it, there was a number of very important things you know, uh, that's re you know, uh, uh, relevant to this cultural revolution motif, cultural radicalization motif, the, uh, the so-called socialist education movement at Beijing University, you know, the, attack, the vicious attack on bourgeois economics and administrators. You know, this is a very important story that's related also uh, I'll be covering this episode in my book because it's related to the, uh, that was the original context of the first wall posters. Uh, no, the, I mean, the first wall poster of Dazi that needs to be conceived in a very different context. And then the denunciations of prominent philosophers, historians, and economists in nine, between 1964 to 1966. Then Jiang Xin's radical operatic reform uh, in 1967, that started in 1963, 1964. Uh, then the purge of the reorganization of the Ministry of Culture. Uh, the entire Ministry of Culture was basically almost dismantled you know, and it was viciously attacked in 1965. And then finally, the first salvo of the high rate and the Wuhan affair in 1965 and 1966. So this is sort of the, you know, the, the context that we need to uh, look at to situate, to contextualize the Hairi affair. So uh, I want to say a few words about uh, the uh, Jiangqing, the radical uh, operatic reform. 
uh, I should note that you know the mouse uh, growing impatience with the pace of radical cultural reform was in fact uh, was in part spurred by his wife Jiang Qing, who had begun her career in the 1930s as a film and Chinese opera actress. Jiang Qing's Peking Opera Revolution, or Jing Ju Geming, was initially inaugurated in 1963 to 1964 and later culminating in the construction and the canonization of the so-called revolutionary model operas or during the Cultural Revolution. The radical opera movement, the radical opera reform movement that Jiang Qing spearheaded was part of a broader, long-standing tradition of artistic and cultural radicalism. And it epitomized the militants' efforts to rekindle, to rekindle the radical cultural thrusts associated with the failed way forward, which kind of went into kind of low tide in the early 60s as a result of the failure of the way forward. As an actor-centered genre of art, which transmitted stories, scenes, and acting repertoires from the past, however, classical Chinese operas presented major challenges to modern militant reformers. In the mid-1960s, Jiang Qing and her militant associates felt that their work had been impeded by both the skeptical cultural establishment and the recalcitrant party officials, despite being personally promoted by the chairman's wife, the Peking Opera Revolution, or Jingju Gemi in particular, and the radical cultural initiatives in general frequently skirmished with party bureaucrats responsible for ideology and propaganda work. Personal squabbles became entangled with broader tensions over style, content, and the politics of socialist art. These conflicts, as I will show in my book, persisted and escalated and culminated in the downfall of prominent intellectuals such as Wuhan and, and top party officials such as Pendant, as in iconic Hairi case on the eve of the Cultural Revolution. So now, okay, I'm moving toward the close. Okay. So now finally, let's take a look at what, you know, what, how Mao himself understood uh, the so-called cultural revolution when it, you know, in, in its very early phase. Uh, I didn't bother to translate into English, because, but, but I will translate. I mean, I, I mean, I will translate, uh, I mean, verbally. This is a, a, a part of the, the, the uh, transcript that of the conversation that took place on March 30th, 1966 at the uh, uh, Hanzhou, the Hanzhou conference, party conference, uh, party bureau conference that were discussing the uh, 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 this the, the this movement that's being you know being being promoted. Uh, so Mao said he said uh, he said in the past he said we were all blinded, we didn't know we didn't know many things. In fact, you know. Uh, it was the, you know, bourgeoisies and petty bourgeoisies, uh, you know, I mean, he was talking about the schools, you know, the art, the academies, the media, the newspapers, and so on and so forth. They were all controlled by the bourgeoisies and petty bourgeoisies. He said, now, the universities, the colleges, the middle schools, primary schools, they were, most of them were controlled by bourgeoisies, landlords, rich peasants, you know, I mean, these intellectuals were descended from you know, from, from bourgeoisie landlords and rich peasants. They were monopolized and controlled by these intellectuals. Then after 1949, he said, we have inherited these people, the intellectuals from these bourgeoisie, I mean, bourgeois and the landlord, rich peasant background. And we, it was correct at the time to inherit, to, 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 to inherit them because we didn't have our own intellectuals. But now we must have a revolution. We must mobilize the young people to challenge these people. He said, then Mao said, he said, from now on, every five to 10 years, we must do this. We must criticize. I mean, to P.B. Nisha, this is kind of a, uh, it's, a, it's a modest kind of way to say, maybe she should say to attack. You know, otherwise, you know, the entire, all these cultural sphere, I mean, will be controlled, monopolized by these people. And Marshall Lin Biao joined in. He said, this is class struggle. And Mao, continued, Mao, Mao concurred. He said, this is an acute class struggle. Class struggle was very acute. It was comprehensive. It was widespread. You know, newspapers, magazines, uh, literature and arts, uh, films, theater, operas, they were all you know, infested with these problems. So in March, in late March and early opera, this is uh, in early April, this was Mao's understanding. 
of the ongoing, of the beginning, of how, I mean, of the nature of this movement, which is about to unfold. And then two months later, uh, in June 19, on June 10th, 1966, in a conversation with Hu Jiming, also in Hangzhou, when Mao was having a party, Central Party Conference, that Mao explained to Hu Jiming, Ho Chi Minh, who was visiting, the meaning, the significance of what was going on in China. Mao said, this recent struggle of ours, which began last November, and he was referring to the attack on Wuhan and Hairi, you know, this great cultural revolution. You know, this great cultural revolution, this is about, you know, we are, this is about attacking Gao. You know, I really struggle how to translate the word, you know, the Chinese word, uh, uh, word Gao. It's, a, it's targeted uh, education, culture, and uh, literature, and arts, you know, the, uh, the, the scholarly domain, philosophy, uh, the field of history, publication, news, media, and the culture and the literature can be decided, I mean, can be divided into many different segments. You know, there are theaters, uh, there are films, there are music, there are fine arts, sculptures. He said this, he said this time, uh, he said we, we will topple, you know, you know, at least hundreds or even thousands of people, especially the it was called the Wujie, the five spheres, the sphere of the, the scholarly sphere, education, publication, uh, news media, uh, uh, literature and arts, then universities, middle schools, primary schools. Then he again, he said, because we didn't have our own people. So we had, in, we had to inherit all these people, the teachers, the professors from the Kuomintang. Uh, the college, the college professors, middle school and primary school uh, teachers, uh, journalists, uh, you know, actors and actresses, uh, novelists, no, uh, painters, uh, uh, filmmakers. We had very few of our own people, so we had inherit these people from the from the previous regime, from the ancient regime, and these people have now wormed, infiltrated into our own party. And these are all very familiar cultural revolution jargon about the infiltration of in, into the party that needs to be exposed and destroyed. So uh, this is very clear that Mao's own understanding at the very beginning of the cultural revolution that was really a cultural revolution that targeted the domain of culture, literature, art, education. It was a cultural revolution with a small case C and a small case R. It was a movement of cultural radicalism, uh, even you know, in Mao's own mind. Okay, so now, uh, 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 now I'm wrapping up. Is that, so if we return to the uh, first salvo or the Wuhan Hairi case of the cultural revolution. So uh, the attack on Wuhan and his Hairi play was to a very significant extent, the result of a distinct set of political processes with their own internal tensions and logics, i.e the long-standing cultural revolution, you know, with a small c, small r. And there exists little compelling evidence aside from the expo, the expo facto rationalization supplied by Mao's leaders themselves to back the view that the incident formed part of Mao's scheme to attack the party. Rather than the calculated opening salvo for a general attack on the party state apparatus and its leaders, the Maoist offensive against prominent cultural figures in late 1965 and early 1966 was more likely an ad hoc event, which recalled many similar incidents of party sanctioned you know, um, assaults in the cultural uh, domain, uh, but, in, but inadvertently creating a unique political situation fraught with misunderstanding and miscalculation. However, the incidents in late 1965 and early 1966 led to the downfall of party leaders of the national capital, which in turn precipitated a rapidly growing grassroots political activism on college campuses, both in Beijing and across the country. However, the incident likely would not have had its momentous crisis catalyzing impact without several originally unconnected cross currents and unexpected subsequent developments that fused to exaggerate and radically transform its initial consequences. So uh, yeah, these are the things that I'm gonna write in my book. So now let me conclude with some questions. 
So uh, in this talk and in this book that I'm writing, you know, I'm, I'm talk, I, I, I talk about cultural evolution, but the problem is, the question is which and what cultural evolution? You know, this is not clear and we need to, uh, we need to uh, tease it out and we need to think very carefully not to take this idea, this category, historiographical category that has been given to us, you know, called the culture of watching or the proletarian culture of watching for at face value or for granted. We need to really kind of to take it apart. So then the next question is uh, that the work points to is, did Mao actually change or widen his objectives along the way? And if he did, when, under what circumstances, why, how, and to what effect? Now, I'm not gonna answer it here. I think I imply you know, some uh, direction of, you know, uh, of inquiry and looking into it. And third, if the culture of Wuxing started as a radical cultural movement or a culture of Wuxing with a small c, a lowercase c and lowercase r, then the logically, then the question would be, how did a culture of Wuxing become the culture of Wuxing? You know, this would be, you know, the question that this work that I'm doing is going to answer. And then finally, we need to beware the limits of the culture of Wuxing or Wenge as a, you know, accepted, as a widely accepted historiographical category. You know, the, I think the, this category actually uh, uh, obscures more than it reveals, it discloses, you know, because uh, really uh, was the culture of Wuxing, I mean, the culture of Wuxing, the CR is singular, you know, distinctive, I mean, a, a discrete historical phenomena. Uh, in fact, I think, you know, this is the things that we can really kind of to make it more complicated, you know. Uh, so I, I'm going to end here uh, and then uh, we'll have some discussions. Okay, thank you. Great, oh, well, thank you so much. Um, really, really rich talk. And now uh, I'm going to start, and I think for the sake of time, uh, I'm just going to read off uh, some of the questions that have uh, been raised so far. So um, <coughs> the first is a question about what are some of the similarities or differences of Soviet-style socialism and communism in China during the Cultural Revolution? Okay, that's a very good question. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's there. There clearly there's some difference. I mean, there's significant differences. You know, Soviet coming I mean, Mao, the Chinese communism in the Mao era was, you know, you know, especially in the study in the late 1950s, early 1960s, and all that. Mao tried to move away from some of the more, more rigid uh, Soviet you know, hierarchical kind of you know Leninist uh, uh, practices. You know. Uh, and the culture of Wuxing, that culture of Wuxing, you know, this kind of mass mobilizing, the mobilization from below, you know, the, uh, uh, to attack the party itself, that would be totally in inconceivable uh, in the, in, under the Soviet, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the Soviet scheme. So Mao, it was, uh, uh, the Chinese communism was a much more complicated, I think it was much more complicated and contradictory kind of phenomena. There's a lot more uh, things that were going on, you know. Even though, you know, Mao actually in 1956, 1957, you know, when uh, uh, when Khrushchev was trying to destalinize, you know, the uh, Soviet 20th Party Congress, you know, uh, Mao actually tried to defend Stalin, you know, uh, and the idea of revisionism, so called, was actually, you know, what Mao had in mind was actually the move with the movement away from Stalin in Soviet Union and the Eastern European countries, in Yugoslavia, in Hungary, in Poland, you know, so Mao was kind of struggling in between, you know, you know, Mao, uh, this is actually quite complicated, I think. So, but this is a very good question. You know, there are some scholars who are saying Mao was just a Stalinist, was a pure Stalinist, you know, probably Professor Andrew Water at, at, at Stanford would argue that way. But there are some scholars who, who, who may argue that Mao was an anti-Stalinist, was un-Stalinist or anti-Stalinist. The culture of Washington was completely un-Stalinist, would try to go the other way. But I think the truth probably somewhere lies somewhere in between, somewhere. Okay, so the next question, uh, to what extent were common people aware of events to come through rumors or speculation on the events leading up to the so-called Big Bang? 
Uh, can you repeat that? I, I kind of lost it in, in, okay. in the middle. Also in the, in the Q&A, if you uh -huh. want to, uh, but to what extent were common people aware of events to come through rumors or speculation on the events leading up to the big okay. event? Uh, com common people didn't really know. You know, the common people, you know, there were lots of great deal of anxiety, you know, there were great deal of uncertainty, but the common people, you know, uh, didn't really know until it happened, really, I think. Uh, the, uh, uh, the month of, you know, from May, June, July, uh, uh, the late spring and early, uh, early summer of 1966 was crucial, and that's what the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the important part that my book would examine that you know uh that to look at how you know the what Roderick McFarquhar called the translation of high politics into mass politics you know which is I think you know is probably you know how how very much I admire I respect Roger, you know Professor McFarquhar's work as being the you know the author of the most authoritative work but I think that needs to be uh thought more carefully to by looking at the sources uh the, uh, uh, there was a layers of layers of mediations, I think, that, you know, the high level, you know, high politics, and also the, you know, interactions, you know, um, things were going both ways, you know, that's, it's not a clear, very clear picture. Okay, the next is a long question. Okay, okay, let me read it myself. Okay, can some short comments on the role of Wang Hong Wen? Oh, I, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a very different, this is not the, okay, this was, uh, uh, okay, I, uh, you've mentioned a lot about Jiang Yao and Zhang Chunqiao, the role in the particular high river one. Okay, this is, uh, this goes outside the scope of this talk and my current work. You know, I, I talk, I talk about the role of Wang Hong in my previous book, uh, Culture of the Margins on the uh, rebel movement in Shanghai. But Wang Hong you know, the, uh, this last member of the Gang of Four didn't really emerge until late 1966. You know the uh, the rebel movement didn't really, you know the uh, uh, the the red guard movement started earlier, maybe in in the summer in July 1966, when the workers movement, workers rebellion didn't really begin until much later. So this is outside the scope of my the work that I'm doing, the scope of my talk. Uh, but it's interesting that needs to be you know the 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 student can look at the book the works by Li Xing, the Shanghai historian who wrote the definitive work on the history of culture revolution in Shanghai, the two volume work. Yeah. Okay, so we actually need to leave the classroom that my class is in because another okay. class is joining. But yeah. um, there's one more question about, is socialist art a major concern for the party state's revolutionary idea before the cultural revolution? That's absolutely yes, absolutely yes. I think, you know, uh, literary scholars have done a great deal of work on, <laughs> Uh, on literature, on art, literature, include, uh, not so much on theater, probably on film. Uh, but the uh, uh, the cultural history scholars have not. There's really no communication between you know cultural history scholars look at political history, look at you know high level politics. Uh, so this uh, uh, this is absolutely this is a uh, uh, it's a very important. Uh, uh, it was one of the most contentious fields. That's you know, a great deal of. You know, debates, you know, yes, persecutions, you know, denunciations, but also creative energies, you know, uh, there's a great deal of things that needs to be done. And I hope somebody can, probably not me, uh, actually, I should have, I should write a book called Cultural Revolution in, in, in China under Mao before I write my current book, which is how a, a cultural revolution turned into the cultural revolution. I need to write that book as the ground for writing my current book, but probably I won't be able to do that. But maybe I'll write a chapter. Great. Okay, so now I'm going to open it up to some uh, other audience members beside the class. And there's a question from Calvin Hui, who um, is at College of William Mary, who says, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, question one, can you talk about how Mao and or the Chinese socialist cultural authorities think theoretically about the mediated relationships between social class and cultural productions? Did they think class ideologies are located in the content? That is, the Cultural Revolution model operas present proletarian characters in a heroic manner? Or did they think 
class ideologies can be located in the form? Um, so let's maybe start with that question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, okay, it's good. To, I mean, thank you for coming, Callan. You know, it's been a long time. Uh, yes, I mean, this is, a, this is a very good question. I, I'm not sure how deep I can get into it because I'm not a cultural studies scholar, even though I think this is something that's very relevant to, my, to the work I'm doing. Uh, but absolutely so. Uh, yes, I mean, the class issue is one of the central issues in cultural debates. You know, the problem of the cultural radicalism, you know, a major thrust of it is to create a, a mass popular form of militant culture. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, also the attack on the so-called bourgeois intellectuals. You know, I mean, the promotion of the working class intellectuals. You know, uh, the, I mean, I think the great leap forward it would be really a fascinating uh, to, if we, to, uh, no, uh, uh, if we want to reconsider, I mean, it, it will be, you know, to reconsider the great leap forward, all these radical cultural uh, initiatives in relation to uh, the problem of class, uh, class and the class identities cultural productions, cultural consumptions in, you know, relating to poetry, you know, history writing, uh, all kinds of other things, you know, paintings, you know, theater, modern opera, you know, I mean, modern theater, so on and so forth. So I think, you know, uh, you know, I want to learn more about this because you know, I, I can probably only write a little, maybe a section in my book. But this is, yes, I have read Taishan's book, you know, Revolutionist Narrative, you know, it's used, yes, and I, I mean, you're actually right, this will be very important to me. And I read it again, and, and I talk to Taylor again. Yeah, thank you, Kelvin. Okay, um, we're beyond time. Um, okay. Uh, Michael, can we ask one more question? Sure. Okay, so um, the final question uh, that I'll ask you to speak about is, should we view the Cultural Revolution as the ultimate climax of a continuous Cultural Revolution conducted by the CCP throughout the early PRC history? Or should we view the Cultural Revolution as a separate revolution launched with its own intention or intentions? Um, that, would, that would depend on what you mean by the Cultural Revolution. To view the Cultural Revolution as the climax of the continuous revolution, that's based on you know, the uh the established you know wisdom that the cultural revolution is results resulted from Mao's preconceived Mao's utopian you know vision but what i'm trying to you know argue in my work is that you know there's actually a some accidents probably contingencies you know even though there's still you know it, you know interesting political logic that connect that make things what they you know i mean what they were uh the uh, uh, yeah, so uh, this grand vision, you know, this Mao's idea of this continuous revolution, you know, pushing from one to another, this revolution perpetuity, you know, this is the kind of thing I think we need to kind of to move away, you know, because this is a story that Mao himself wanted to tell, his own associates want to, you know, Mao, I mean, that I and mean, then the great leader, of course, is always correct, always knew it beforehand, you know, so I think we should, you know, 50 years after. Mao's departure, we need to step out of his shadow, you know, to keep some histor historical distance, to think about it, you know, uh, with more kind of critical eyes, I think. Great. Um, so I think, uh, first, I want to sort of thank you for this really, really rich talk and um, your, your, your time. Um, and I think, let's see, if there, there's a few other um, questions maybe not quite as relevant to the actual talk, but about um, the motivations for Mao to become a communist and mm. so forth that are maybe beyond the scope of what you're sharing with us here today. But um, I want to thank you for yeah, uh, thank you talking with our students. Thank you. You know, I'll be happy to stay here. You know, I mean, just to keep this window open, if, if uh, the people want to chat with me, I'll be happy to. You know. Uh, uh, and I think I use more time than I should because this actually contains the uh, scheme of two different talks, two different related talks. One is to try to take down the existing, the prevailing narrative, and the other is try to look at something else. Uh, so that's why I think I, it's 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 kind of difficult to to. Uh, but but, but you know, if people have want to discuss. I'll be happy to stay here. You know, just pretend that we are in person in the same room. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Golashi.
Thank you, Professor Wu. Thank you, Professor yeah. Goldman. This was wonderful. So why don't we stop recording?